worship you. I ask that you uh, please fill this place with your spirit. And I ask that you please uh, be with Dave as he gives us a message that you have placed on his hearts. I ask that you please uh, let us be receptive to that. Keep distractions out the door. And I say, uh, just please be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, let me do some announcements here. Next weekend, <coughs> uh, Rick Welsh and the Burrows of Berea podcast will be here. They're going to do some recording. We have two people sharing their testimony. Doctors Jordan and Leah Grant are coming next weekend, so Jordan's going to share his testimony. <clears throat> and then we're going to have a roundtable discussion. We usually do that, have a roundtable discussion when we're here giving testimonies. And this time, you ready for this? The roundtable discussion is going to be on Flat Earth. So, if you have questions, now listen, please. Listen, listen, listen. Don't send me your questions now. Okay, come. we're going to deal with questions from the message today. After today, send your questions in, and Jordan and I would love to have some questions from you. Problems you have, questions you have, send them in, and we'll try to deal with that in the podcast. And um, we'll try to keep it within an hour, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and listen, Saturday, those of you who are local, you can come here Saturday and be part of this if you want. Okay, you can listen to the testimonies. You can be part. You can ask your questions live uh, to us about this. So, um, no, no. Go somewhere else. For those of you that are globe heads, you can uh, <laughs> you can come in and ask your questions. We can. We were glad to straighten you out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll be glad to flatten you out. <laughs> Good one, Anthony. <laughs> you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't do it, but I like to troll people, you know. And so a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Israel. I said they're the most evil people on God's flat earth. Oh, my <laughs> word. Go to the comments on YouTube on that. <laughs> Did he just say flat earth? Are they flat? Blah, 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 all these comments. I'm like, most of them positive, okay? Because most people realize the earth is flat. They, they broke away from the indoctrination and they get the truth. But some people are still hanging on to their spinning balls. So hang on to it. Hang on to it. A thousand miles an hour. We're spinning. No, no questions. We're not doing questions now. Oh, that's a good question. I wish I could answer you, but I don't have a clue. I don't know what time we're meeting. I'm going to have to find that out and we'll have to let you know. So if you're interested in coming Saturday, uh, text me near the end of the week, and because uh, I don't know what time. It'll be in the afternoon. Um, I, I'm thinking probably around like 2 o'clock, 2 to 5 maybe, something like that. All right? So we'll bring your questions. Bring the, bring the best question you can come up with, okay? Give us some challenging questions, all right? Because we'll like to deal with that. All right. Good morning, Bereans. Appreciate y'all being here this morning. Those watching live, thanks for joining us. Have you noticed that when anything happens in Israel, the prophecy pundits just go nuts and start talking about the end of the world? Have you noticed that? Why? Why every time something happens in Israel do they start talking about the end of the world? No, no response? They do that because the Bible connects the end of the age and Israel. They're connected. Okay? Totally connected. That's why they do it. The end times in Israel are connected. The last days and Israel are connected. Now, if you had a King James Bible, the end of the world and Israel are connected. But it's not the end of the world. That's a bad translation. King James has messed a lot of people up with that. The world's not ending, it's the age that ends. Um, this week I had some fun, I just went on YouTube and typed in Israel in the end times, and boy, I got a lot of uh, prophecy pundits yelling and screaming about, you know, it's, this, is, uh, this is it, alright? Greg, Greg Laurie, in a video entitled, What the Terror Attacks on Israel Mean for the End Time Prophecy, says this. He says, the Bible predicted thousands of years ago that the end time events would revolve around Jerusalem. 
Totally agree. That's what it does. The Bible teaches that. That's how come they're, they're doing this. He says, it is the focal point of end time events. Again, I agree. But then he says this. Here's what I know. We are in the last days. No, this is what he thinks, but he's wrong, okay? He's wrong. We're not in the last days, and we're going to talk about that this morning. But that's the confusion. Because people think we're in the last days. They think anything that happens in Israel, that's a sign that the world's about to end. In another YouTube video, Isaiah Saldivar says, we are literally watching Bible prophecy fulfilled in our eyes, before our eyes. No, we're not, okay? We're not watching it at all. Because all prophecy was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when the Jewish temple was destroyed. Notice what Yeshua says. People seem to ignore this. He says, but when you, the, the you here is not you, Okay, it's the first century people he's talking to in Jerusalem, talking to Jews. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, okay, you people, you see the armies coming in, then know the armies are coming, then know that desolation has come near. You can figure that out. We're surrounded by armies, we're in trouble, all right? Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. All that is written includes all prophecy. Everything written about the prophets, everything, every prophetic thing in the Bible was fulfilled in AD 70. That was a culmination. August of AD 70, all prophecy came to a completion, was fulfilled at that time. Now there's ongoing results of many of those, but they were fulfilled at that time. Saldivar goes on to say, Bible prophecy revolves around Israel. Again, no, no question about that. That's the thing. You know, here's the thing, people. The church has no end times. End times are all deal with Israel. Okay? It's all about Israel. Now, let's look at what the New Testament says about the last days, just so we can start getting an idea. Because this is what we have to understand. If you don't understand the last days, you're going to constantly be confused and tormented by every event that happens in politics. All right? 2 Timothy 3.1 but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Okay, so anytime someone has some difficulty, it's the last days. <laughs> no, it's not, okay. Hebrews 1, 2, that Sam read this morning, he said, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. James 5, 3, Your gold and your silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. And then Peter says in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Now, when you hear the phrase, last days, what should your first question be? Exactly. Thank you. The last days of what? There's all kinds of last days, right? Hopefully... We're in the last days of Biden's residency, okay? Hopefully. There's, there's a lot of last days. You know, you got your last days of shopping before Christmas, last days of this, last days of that, okay? But, so when you see last days, you got to ask, what? what? What last days? And what's really sad is that most Christians here last days, they never ask that question because they just assume they know it's the last days of the world, right? The world's all going to be destroyed, they assume it's referring to the last days of the end of the world. Now again, that's only because they're probably reading from a King James Bible and it terribly translates the word I own, age, to world. Now I think most Christians today would probably say that we, 21st century American Christians, are living in the last days of the earth. The last days of the world. That's a very commonly held view. Joseph Koch writes this. He says, do we see the signs of the times? <laughs> I love that. It's a sign of everything that happens. It's a sign of the time, you know? Really? Is it a biblical sign of the time? Yeah, what time? He says, mark this. Paul wrote, there will be terrible times in the last days. And what do we see now? America at war. Shootings in school. So you, a shooting in school, that's the end of, that's a sign of the time. Disasters in the weather. Oh, we got a bad storm. It's a sign of the times. The world's about to end. Does, it's all coming to a climax. Will World War III soon be upon us? We are living in the last days. 
See, this is just, this is so common, people. I would say that most Christians, unless they're preterists, believe they're living in the last days, the end of the world, the earth's about to be destroyed, everything's gone, and so that's, that's why they get scared when something happens in Israel and all the prophecy pundits start yelling. Well, let's examine what the Bible says about the last days and see if we can come to some understanding of their meaning. Because I think that most everyone would agree that the last days began at the time of Christ. All right, I think most people agree there. Look at Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, Sam read. Long ago and in many times, many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So in the past, he's saying God spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by the Son. So if the Son's there, guess what? We're in the last days, right? Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So the writer of Hebrews says that they, first century Christians, were hearing God speak through his Son, which meant it was the last days. Okay, we got that. Last days started at the time of Christ. We all on that same page there? The big debate comes over, when do they end? And most Christians believe they have not ended yet. That's a long last days. What is it the last days of? And see, if you ask, if you find out, well, it's the last days of Israel, the last days can't be longer than their total existence, Right? It just, that would make no sense. So hopefully our study will help us answer some of these questions. When are the last days? When do they end? Now in order to understand the term last days, we need to look at the phrase that was originally used in the Hebrew Scriptures. The Bible's first use of the phrase last days is found in Genesis. Genesis 49.1 Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. I don't think that's a very good translation. The complete Jewish Bible translates this. Then Yaakov called for his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, and I will tell you what will happen to you in the Aharit Hayamim. All right, that's the Hebrew there. Aharit Hayamim. And in Hebrew, that means last days. Now consider who this phrase last days is primarily addressed. Jacob's talking to his sons, the twelve tribes of Israel, and he pronounces the general evil that will come upon them. So clearly, Israel is the subject of the last days, the first time it's mentioned, okay? It's about Israel. All right, let's move on. Numbers. Wow. Must be. It's a sign of the times, okay? That. And you'll hear fire trucks. That's a sign of the times. If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of Yahweh to do either good or bad of my own will. What Yahweh speaks, that will I speak. And now behold, I am going to my people. Come, and I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the Aharit Hayamim, the last days. Now the King James here says, in the latter days, Young's literal says the latter end of the days. So here again we see the vision is concerning the Jews. All right, this is talking about the Jews. Was current what would happen to Israel in the last days? So Isaiah predicts the last days as well. In Isaiah two one and two, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos says concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days, aharit haimim that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established in the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up upon the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. This vision is concerning Judah and Jerusalem. This is speaking of the new covenant that is going to be inaugurated in the last days. Nowhere is the phrase last days used to refer to the earth, physical earth, dirt. But rather it's referring to the last days of the nation Israel. Now Moses confirms that the last days of national Israel would be characterized by devastation and their ultimate scattering in Deuteronomy 4.27. And Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahweh will drive you. Verse 30, he says, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, aharit ayamim, you will return to Yahweh your God and obey His voice. He continues this towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, 29. 
For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come, evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking Him to anger through the work of your hands. So Moses said this is going to come upon them in the Aharit Hayamim. He's leading the company of Israel. So that's who he's talking to, Israel. He's not talking to Gentiles here being the subject of the last days. It's always addressed to Israel. Like Jeremiah has to say, Jeremiah 23, 16-20. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. He's talking about false prophets that are coming up, making up these prophecies, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of Yahweh. They say continually to those who despise the word of Yahweh, it shall be well with you. See, God, they're just said, don't worry about all those prophecies about doom and destruction. It, everything's going to be okay. It'll be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you, for who among them has stood in the council of Yahweh? In other words, he's saying that's what a true prophet would have someone who'd been in the council of Yahweh and got word from Yahweh. To see or hear what his word, or who has paid attention to his word, and listen. Behold, the storm of Yahweh, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. So he's telling him, listen, you're going to get this. Again, dealing with Israel, you're going to get this in the last days. Now, throughout the book of Jeremiah, God condemns the Jewish false prophets. And here Jeremiah predicts that when these last days come, the people of Yahweh will understand that he is referring to their nation and destroying it and punishing it because of their wickedness. Now Yahweh through Ezekiel warns Israel also, who he calls my people, of their destruction by the hand of foreign nations. Ezekiel 38. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land in the latter days. And I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. We see the same thing in Daniel. Michael the archangel spoke to Daniel associating the latter days with Daniel's people. He says in Daniel 10.14, And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people. That's the Jews, right? Daniel's people are the Jews. In the latter days, for the vision is yet to come. Now the phrase your people, again referring to Israel, they're Daniel's people. The time of this writing is about 536 B.C. And he says that the vision will happen to Israel in the latter days. He says it's a long way off. The vision is for days yet to come. So in Daniel's time, the last days were a long way off. And he uses long in the sense of 536. So we come to the New Testament and we say they're a long way off or they're near, it's at hand, it's shortly, how can that be over 2,000 years? Daniel's 500 is a long time away. All right, God, God knows how to tell time, okay? Hosea also talks about the elect remnant who will turn to Yahweh in the last days. In Hosea 3, 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to Yahweh and to His glory and to His goodness in the latter days. This is talking about Israel trusting their Messiah, Yeshua. And finally in Micah, the prophet states that the last days involve the destruction of physical Israel and the establishment of true Israel. Now, of course, you're going to read Micah, you're not going to understand this until you come to the New Testament and it is explained and Paul lays out the details. But in Micah 3.12 he says, Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the house a wooded height. So here we see the destruction of national Israel. But then look at 4.1. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and the people shall flow into it. All right, in the latter days, this is what's going to happen. All right, the people shall flow into it. 
Now look at these. You got 312. It says, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. And then in 4.1, he says, it's going to be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow into it. Now, in order to understand these verses, people, you got to understand there's two Israels. And until Paul teaches us that, I don't think too many people get it. All right? But Jerusalem as a nation is going to be destroyed. It's going to be a heap of ruins, but there's going to be lifted up the true remnant of those people. And Paul teaches us this in 9.6, and we've looked at this many times, but people, this is a key verse to understanding all this stuff about Israel, all right? Because Romans 9, 10, 11 is all about Israel, and this Paul makes it really clear in the beginning. It's not as though the Word of God has failed. In other words, you people feel like the promises God made, He's going back on. God hasn't gone back on His promises. They never were to you. They were to true Israel. Not you national people didn't all get in on the promise. And he demonstrates that all through Romans. He says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. People go, oh, that can't be. God can't hate. God can do whatever he wants, okay? Well, hated means he didn't like him. We'll go back and read Malachi and tell me how much he didn't like him, okay? That's where he's quoting from, okay? So first Israel is, the first Israel used here, not all who were descended from Israel. That is national Israel. The physical, ethnic Jews, they come through the nation. All right, the second Israel is used for the true Israel. So not all those who are in that physical group have trusted in their Messiah, look forward to the Messiah, believe the promises that God made. They're not part of that group. Now, last week we looked at Romans 9, 27, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea. And they were. They were as numerous as the sand of the sea. God promised that. God fulfilled that. Then he says this. Only a remnant of them will be saved. Okay, we got that, right? But then we come to chapter 11, and it says, In this way, all Israel will be saved. So, which is it? Okay, is it a remnant, or is it all? Let me ask you something. Is this a contradiction in Scripture? No, because there are no contradictions in Scripture, all right? The primary rule of hermeneutics is called the analogy of faith. That means Scripture is to interpret Scripture, and no part of Scripture can be interpreted in such a way as to render it in conflict what is clearly taught elsewhere in Scripture. And, and it's a safeguard to help us prevent you know, reading Scripture into Scripture that's not there. So there's no contradiction, so the, co the problem here is ours. This is, people, an apparent contradiction. Because it looks like a contradiction, doesn't it? It can't be both. It can't be a remnant at all. So it's an apparent contradiction. All right? So, what do we do with it? How do we solve this? How do we figure out what he's talking about? Well, I would start with dealing with the words and make sure we're all on the same page with the same words, right? First of all, he uses sozo, save. Now, for us, Americans, 21st century, we see sojo, we think he, sojo, eternal life. Right? Redemption from God. And I believe that's how he's using it here. And I'll try to prove that in a second. I think that's very easy to prove here. But some people deal with this argument in the sense that, like David Danos, he said, well, saved here is not used in, in the way we think of it. It's used in the Hebrew way. The Hebrews thought of sozo not as eternal life. They thought of it as physical deliverance, ransom, being saved from something. You know, we're in a disaster. We're being saved from something. All right? As remember, Paul said, unless you abide on the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, stay on the ship, you go to heaven. Get off the ship, you're going to hell. No, that's not what he's saying, all right? He says, you will die if you don't stay on the ship. You'll drown. Okay, and that's the typical Hebrew sense of the word. That's how James uses it in James 2, which throws so many people for a loop and they get all confused. So I think Nano's argument makes sense that this could be used in a different way, but not how Paul... Paul only uses this word sozo five times in, uh, in this section on the theodicy of God. Five times. And in Hebrews 10... He, taught, he makes it real clear that you believe you'll be saved. All right, so he's, it's definitely talking about salvation, redemption. Now, he starts out in this way. He starts out verse 26. In this way, all Israel will be saved. This is the adverb, how to. And it can be translated, in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Now, how to can refer to what precedes or what follows. And it seems logical here to connect it with what follows. And so he says, in this manner... Israel will be saved. How? A deliverer will come out of Zion. That's a reference to the second coming. Okay? So how are they going to be saved? They're going to be saved at the second coming. 
Now, if you're a preterist, you understand that redemption, eternal life, did not come until the second coming. Until it was complete, then man could enter into eternal life. In the Scriptures, it says eternal life comes in the age to come. They weren't in that age yet, so they didn't have it. So they will be saved, all Israel will be saved when the Deliverer comes out of Zion. All right, so I think the word saved means what we think of it meaning. But then we have to deal with the word Israel. Israel. It's the same Greek word in both cases. So how do we solve this? If they're both Israel, what's going on here? Well, Paul solved it for us in 9.6. He says there's two Israels. There's a physical and national. All right? And so we have to deal with that. 9.26 here is referring to national Israel. A remnant. A remnant of that whole group of people that are numbered as the sand of the sea. A remnant of them, a remnant, a partial amount of them are going to be saved. That's national Israel. When we come to 26, he is talking about spiritual, true Israel. All Israel will be saved. And the all Israel here is the same all of 1012, all who call upon Him. That's true Israel. It involves... It involves the ten northern tribes, the southern kingdom, and all Gentiles who will eventually come in to that through faith in Christ. All right? So, we, we dealt with this last week, but I just wanted to hit on this a little more because these are very important verses here. Because you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, this is referring to national Israel is going to come back as a nation. No, no. He's already stressed that only a remnant, only a remnant is going to be delivered through this. So let's, let's look a little closer at what Paul's saying here. In Romans 9, because I think it's, it's important to our understanding of the last days and who Israel is. He says, only a remnant will be saved. Now, Paul is quoting here from Isaiah, all right? He goes back to get his doctrine from Isaiah, and as, as he says, like, he cries out. That's the Hebrew, kradzo, it means an impassioned utterance. Isaiah 10.22, quoted here by Paul, testifies of the rejection of a great body of Jews and the election of a small group of them. That is the proposition with which Paul began. They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. So we see this in 10.22. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. Now, who is Isaiah speaking to here? Well, he's talking about the Assyrian captivity. Who was it that Assyria captured? It was Israel, the ten northern tribes. And Isaiah predicts that due to the Assyrian invasion, Israel will be greatly reduced in number. Only a remnant is going to return, because Assyria took them and carried them away captive. All right? Only, he says, a remnant is going to return. The word remnant means that which is left. So the Scriptures demonstrate that God promises... God promises do not pertain to the mass of Israel but are fulfilled only in the remnant. In verse 28 he says, For the Lord will carry out His sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. He is quoting here from Isaiah again, 10.23. And the context of Isaiah's prophecy was that the apostasy of the northern kingdom of Israel, they had walked away from God, they were serving idols, they were worshiping all kinds of gods. It was judgment was brought through the Assyrians. We've got to understand that. If you understand that, it helps you understand A.D. 70. Okay? God used foreign nations to discipline His people. But Paul uses this here as a warning to his fellow Jews. He says God is going to judge Israel, and he quickly tells them there's only going to be a remnant left. And Paul's quoting Isaiah, who talks about the invasion. But I think he's also hinting at the destruction that's going to come by the Romans in A.D. 70. Because it's the same thing, people. All right? Look at Amos 3. 11 and 12, Therefore thus says the Lord Yahweh, An adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you, and your strongholds shall be plundered. Thus says Yahweh, As the shepherd rescues from the mouth of a lion two legs or the piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and a part of a bed. And you're saying, what in the world is going on here? People, this is a biblical picture of divine judgment. Okay? He's saying Israel's going to be like, you go to get, you go to redeem them, you go to get them, there's nothing left but a couple leg bones and a piece of an ear. All right? That's all that's left. It's because it's destruction. Vivid picture of destruction. Now, these little bits would be rescued by the shepherd to prove 
that the shepherd had not stolen or sold one of the sheep. You know, it was attacked. Here's all that's left of it. That was proof he wasn't being, you know, a bad shepherd. It got attacked and no, he didn't sell it off or someone stole it. But it's a picture of judgment. Amos 3, 2. God tells Israel, you only have I known. And by known there, he means in an intimate way, love. By you only, you only have I love of all the families on the earth. He says, therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Because Israel had a special relationship with the Lord, therefore it was also had a great responsibility. God's going to save a little of Israel from judgment. That's what he's telling them in Romans 9, bringing it from Isaiah. And then 929, he says, as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. All right, so he quotes here from Isaiah 1.9. The word offspring is the Greek sperma, and it means seed, so he changes remnant to seed. It means the same thing. Who is Isaiah talking to here? Well, the previous three quotes were about Israel. This one is also, if we back up in the context, okay, to the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. That's what this is about. He's speaking to Judah. He said, a seed or a remnant will be saved from Judah, and a remnant will be saved from Israel, and these two will be brought together to form true Israel, all Israel. Now Paul's primary focus here is Israel. It's not the Gentiles. And as a result of Israel's salvation, the Gentiles would also be called and be brought into this. Now, an ancient Israelite, just like a modern Christian, might object to the doctrine of sovereign election. People don't like God making choices that, that we don't like, okay, that we haven't approved, so to speak, all right? So in Israel, it might object to the doctrine of election, but the fact that God chooses some, not all, to be saved. But Paul says in verse 29, he says, we would have been like Sodom and like Gomorrah. So what's he saying there? Sodom and Gomorrah pictures total and complete destruction. God rained down and just destroyed those cities. That was a devastating judgment. But there was a tiny remnant escaped from that. In the very beginning, God called out Lot and his family out of Sodom before he judged it. All right? That's, that calling out Lot and his family is a foretaste of the exodus and finally of the new exodus. Only a remnant, a seed, escaped the destruction of Jerusalem as the true seed of Israel fled Jerusalem because their Lord told them to do that. And we see that. Let's go back to Luke 21 again. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of there. You see the armies. Don't hang around and wait for problems. Get out of there. Let those who are inside the city dip heart. Let not those who are out in the country enter it. Don't you, you see a war coming, don't run into it, which was the natural instinct because Jerusalem was a fortress. He said, don't do that. Get out. Get away. That's going down. So only the remnant, the true seed, escaped. The rest of Israel was made like Sodom and Gomorrah. They were totally destroyed. So this verse clearly shows that being an Israelite was not enough to secure either exemption from divine judgment or enjoy the favor of God. Okay, It was only the remnant. Now Paul draws from Hosea, he draws from Isaiah as proof that God planned that not all Israel will be saved. The only reason anyone believes is because God's chosen them. That's, all, that's why they get part of the remnant. God chooses them to be part of that remnant. He calls them into His family. Now on that YouTube video I talked about earlier that Isaiah Saldivar talked, he said this, why we, why we stand with Israel, he says, God loves Israel. So he, he, in this video, he gives seven reasons why all Christians should stand with Israel, should support Israel, all of which are total nonsense. All right, but I'm just going to pick on the first one here. He says, because God loves Israel. So if God loves Israel, we should stand with Israel. Then he quotes, he, to prove his point, he quotes Jeremiah. Thus says Yahweh, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, Yahweh appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And so he quotes this verse. He said, God loved Israel with an everlasting love that will never end. So because God loves them everlasting, no matter what they do, no matter how they act, no matter who they kill, God loves them. We should do the same. Well, I don't know if he understands the, the principle of Scripture interpretation that context is king, but all we got to do is drop down a few verses to verse 7. Thus says Yahweh, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob. 
Raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. So who are his people? They're the remnant. That's who his people are. Those are the ones that God loved. I loved you. Who? The whole nation? No, he's speaking of the remnant. Save your people. That's his people. It's the remnant. So the everlasting love of love God is not for the... <laughs> Sounded like Biden there for a minute. <laughs> Whoa, I got... Come on, slow down a little bit. Slow down. Woo. I had a flashback. I was like, wow. <laughs> Where am I? Thanks for being here. <laughs> Shoo, that was scary. <laughs> yeah, I got my brain can't keep up with my mouth. <laughs> or my mouth can't keep up. I don't know which one it is. All right. So everlasting love of God is not for the nation. And that's where they're confused, okay? It is for his remnant. God made it so clear with the nation all through the scriptures. If you don't obey me, I'm going to destroy you. But they say, oh, it's everlasting love. No, it wasn't. God dealt with them. One thing we have to understand is the term Israel, hopefully you got this by now, is not like Ammon or Moab or Greece or Rome. Israel can't be defined in terms of physical descent or understood simply on the human side. It's created not by blood or soil, but by the promise of God. And the thing today, we think those people over there, they call themselves Jews, they call themselves Israel, so most people agree and think they are. They're not. There's no ethnic connection to the people of Israel. There's no spiritual connection. They're not following the Mosaic Law. They don't care about the Bible. They follow the Talmud. So no connection there. All right? We've got to keep that in mind. Now, the dispensationalist says, God is going to defend national Israel in His time. But the problem is the exact opposite is true. Okay? He promised to destroy national Israel. Okay? And, and resurrect the remnant, His people. He's going to destroy her nationally, politically, but spiritually, he's going to resurrect her. Israel's last days came, and Yahweh destroyed them. The nation of Israel has not existed for 2,000 years. National Israel was destroyed in AD 70, and those in the Middle East who affirm themselves as Israel have no right to do so. Okay, The end times, the last days, they came for Israel. They came in the past. All right, then after that, there was no Israel. There was no, none of these people, the Palestinians lived in that land. And then, you know, through the Rothschilds and their evil intentions, they wanted to create Israel. They wanted a headquarters for the deep state. That's the whole purpose for their creation as a headquarters for the deep state. As I said before, they're the, one of the most evil groups, the leaders. I'm not talking about the individual people who call themselves Jews, but the leaders in Israel, Netanyahu and the others, are evil to the core. All right, that's the hub for child sex trafficking. That's the hub for so many evil things. There is no Jewish race or nation today. Yahweh put an end to it. The last days were the last days of Israel. The last days ended when the nation ended. Okay, When the old covenant ended. Without the Mosaic law, you don't have Israel anymore. Okay, You can't have Israel without the Mosaic law, without a priesthood, without a temple. None of those things exist. Alright, so let's move into the New Testament and see if we can verify these truths. In the book of Acts, we find a profound statement made by Peter, who was a Jew, to a multitude of Jews out of every nation. In Acts 2, at Pentecost. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. So we know he's talking to, right? Let these be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall, see, shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my Spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, we've got to ask a couple questions here. Who is Peter talking to? He tells us, men of Judea, those who dwell in Jerusalem. Talking to Jews, talking to Israelites. All right? When did he say this? He said it in the first century, to first century Israelites. And Peter explicitly says, this is the prophecy that Joel, this is what Joel talked about, people. We have the book of Joel, we have this prophecy. It's being fulfilled right now, he says. Then he explains 
that what the multitude of Jews were experiencing was the fulfillment of that prophecy. He's telling this multitude that they, first century Jews, were in the last days. Because the prophecy is being fulfilled now, obviously they're in the last days. Beyond this, he goes on to describe what would take place during these last days. Now here's what I want you to understand. Peter's, I mean, Joel's prophecy here is about the Christ event. And when I say that, I mean, I'm talking about the transition period, the 40 years. This prophecy started in Pentecost. This prophecy ends in the destruction of Jerusalem. And we see that in the end of this prophecy. He says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's Pentecost. Your old men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and on my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Then he says, and I will show wonders. This is AD 70, so we've got a 40-year period. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. So that sounds, you know, that doesn't sound like a good prophecy, okay? This is what's going to happen. The sun's going to be turned to darkness. Now notice how this corresponds to what Yeshua said, all right? Because Yeshua taught the same thing in Matthew 24, verse 29. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars are going to fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven are going to be shaken. So Yeshua spoke these words in answer to the disciples' question. Question as to when the end of the age would come. This is Matthew 24. This is what it's all about. Matthew 24, 1-3 says, Yeshua left the temple and was going away. All right, So He's walking away from the Jerusalem temple. When His disciples came to Him to point out the buildings of the temple. So He's leaving it and they point to the buildings of the temple. But He answered them. You see all these. All these are the buildings of the temple. Do you not? Truly I say to you, first century disciples, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And he sat at the Mount of Olives. The disciples came privately saying, all right, this would have shocked them to the core. You're saying all this magnificent temple, this house of God is going to be destroyed? It's all going to be torn down? So they come to him, tell us, when will these things be? That's a good question, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't you ask that question? You know, your house of worship, the place that, you know, God dwells, and he said, this is all going to be destroyed. Like, uh, when? How much time do we have? The question is twofold. First they ask, when will this thing be? The, these things refers to the temple's destruction in verse 2. In verse 1, the disciples point out the temple buildings. He says, all these things are going to be destroyed. So it should be clear that they're asking, when will the temple be destroyed? When will our house be left desolate? After all, Yeshua had just said about the judgment on Jerusalem in chapter 23, and then about not one stone being left upon another, the disciples' response is when. That just makes sense. And the second part of the question is, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? If you compare all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see that the disciples considered His coming and the end of the age to be identical events in the, with the destruction of the temple. So get that. These disciples, the end of the age, not the world, but the end of the Jewish age, the destruction of the temple, they saw those together. All right, They considered it destruction, the end of the age, the coming of the Lord. Those were all in their mind. They all worked together. Notice in the first part of the verse, he says, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? When's this going to happen? If you compare these, you, you get this idea. When will these things be? What's going to be the sign of your coming? And all this is accomplished. The sign of His coming, the end of the age, was the same as these things which referred to the destruction of the temple. The disciples had one thing and only one thing on their mind. That was the temple being destroyed. And with the temple, again, pre, please get this, with the destruction of the temple, they connected the coming of the Messiah and the end of the age. Judaism. Old Covenant. Their question was, when will the end be? And Yeshua tells them exactly when it will be in this chapter. When, when does He tell them it's going to happen? I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things, all the things I've just talked about in the previous verses, will come to, pla will come to pass. Now, man, what people do with this verse is crazy, okay? It's this generation, not that generation. 
Not some generation, not a future generation. The, one, the people I'm talking to here, generation means contemporaries. So the age that was to end was the Jewish age. It would end with the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. That makes sense. If our temple's destroyed, if we have no priesthood, if we can't offer sacrifices, the age is ended. Judaism's done. The old covenant's over. It was not the last days of the world. The Jews never looked at it that way. He's talking about the last days, the end of Judaism, the old covenant. You know, in Jeremiah, God told Israel he's going to make a new covenant with them, right? 3131, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, do you know any Christians that don't think they're in the new covenant? But yet, who's this you do covenant for? House of Israel, house of Judah. It's not to the national house of Israel, house of Judah. It's to the spiritual, the new covenant. And you got a new covenant. What happens to the old covenant? You don't need that anymore, do you? You don't need it. The new covenant began at Pentecost. That's what they were there celebrating. Then for the next 40 years, the old covenant began to fade away. The temple was still there. They're still offering sacrifices. All right? Hebrews 8.13. And speaking of a new covenant, it makes the first one obsolete. I got a new covenant. We don't need the old covenant anymore, right? We don't have to do this. The old covenant all pictured Christ. Every sacrifice pictured Christ. Every feast day pictured Christ. If Christ came... We don't need shadows and pictures anymore. We have the reality. So the new covenant, he makes the first obsolete. And then he says what is becoming obsolete, because it's in this transition, it's fading away, it's growing old, it's ready to vanish away. It was just fading, okay, during that time. It vanished in A.D. 70 when God destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, putting an end to the old covenant, consummating the new covenant. God was done with national Israel, and it was only those of faith in Christ who were the remnant of the true Israel. Those from national Israel who had faith, those Gentiles who had faith, all Israel would be saved who had trust in Christ. The disciples knew that the fall of the temple and the destruction of the city meant the end of the old covenant age and the inauguration of a new age. So they knew that. This happened. That the, the age is done. It is over. It is gone. He says, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. You know, modern commentators generally understood this and what follows as the end of the world. You know why they do that? Because they're ignorant of the Bible. I don't know how to say that nicely. But I mean, where do you think this language comes from? They just made up new language? Listen, if you got a book and you start at the last quarter reading it, you're going to be a little bit confused, Okay. But if you start from the beginning, when you get to the last quarter, you know the language they're using came from the first three quarters, okay? And this, all this language comes from the Tanakh, what people call the Old Testament. It's apocalyptic language. They've used it all through the Bible. So if you just pick it up in the last quarter, you're not going to get what's going on here. You're not going to understand what Christ is saying. This language is very common of the Old Covenant prophets. The idea is clearly seen when we look at passages that mention the destruction of a state or a nation that uses the same exact language talking about the end of the world. Because if you just read this, okay, you just your average Christian, you pick it up and you read, the stars will fall from heaven. What do you think is going to happen? Stars, stars are going to fall from heaven. Okay? First of all, you know how many light years they say these stars are away? It would take them a long time to fall, okay, to get anywhere near us. Okay, but we know they're in the Rakia. They're not, you know, 10 billion, trillion miles away. But you'd read this and you'd just say, yeah, the stars are going to fall. The powers of heaven are going to be shaken. This is terrible. This is the end of the world. And that's what you'd think if you're not familiar with scriptural language. But let's go back and see how the scripture uses this. Isaiah 13.1 The oracle concerning Babylon. An oracle means a judgment. The, the Hebrew word here is Massah and it means an utterance chiefly of doom. So who is this oracle of doom about? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Babylon. Okay? That's it. Okay, it's about Babylon. Get that in your mind, okay? He's talking to Babylon. I'm giving you an oracle concerning Babylon, a doom concerning Babylon. All right. The introduction sets the stage for the subject matter. If you forget this, your interpretation of Isaiah 13 can go just about anywhere your imagination wants to go. But if you keep in context, this is about Babylon. All right? 
Then he says in verse 6, Wail, for the day of Yahweh is near. For who? Babylon. The destruction from the Almighty, it will come. It's to Babylon he's talking. And that's only to Babylon he's talking. Let's look. drop, drop down to verse 9 through 13. Behold, the day of Yahweh comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. The stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Now, so this is worldwide then, right? No, it's Babylon's world, okay? That's, he's talking to Babylon, it's Babylon's world. I'll punish the world, it's not the, everybody out there, it's the world of Babylon. He already set that stage, okay? I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant, and I will lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold, and mankind than the gold of Ophrah. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place, and the wrath of Yahweh of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now remember, he's speaking about the destruction of Babylon, but it sounds like worldwide destruction. But the terminology of a context can't be expanded beyond the scope of the subject under discussion. The spectrum of language surely can't go outside the land of Babylon. And here's what we have to understand. If you were a Babylonian, and Babylon is destroyed... Would your world end? Absolutely. Okay. It would sure seem like your world was destroyed because you're a Babylonian. You live there, so it's your world. Yes, your world would be destroyed. Like if a foreign power came in here and destroyed America, the stars would fall from the sky. Okay, for us. Again, that's apocalyptic language. All right. People, this, what he's talking about, he says, Behold, I am stirring up the Medes. All right. This is another group against them who will have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. All right, so God's bringing the Medes in to destroy the Babylonians. That's how God does it. In AD 70, He uses the Romans. Here, He's using the Medes. Go destroy the Babylonians. Their world comes to an end. This was a historical event. We know that it took place in 539 B.C. when the Medes destroyed Babylon. The Babylonian world came to an end. This destruction is said in verse 6 to be from the Almighty, but the Medes constitute the means that Yahweh used to accomplish this task. This is, again, apocalyptic language. This is the way the Bible discusses the fall of a nation. It's obviously figurative. Yahweh did not intend for us to take this literally. If we take it literally, the world ended in 539 B.C. It's hard to believe that, though, right? Because we got history beyond that, and here we are. So I don't think the world ended there. So you've got to understand that. So when we understand the language, then we get a better picture of what he's talking about in the New Testament. Have we seen the last days concern the nation Israel? In fact, the very first mention of last days, as we've seen, was by Jacob, the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. More importantly, Jacob was addressing the twelve sons or tribes and speaking about the evil that would befall those tribes in the last days. All right. The question is, how does this relate to the language of Yeshua or Peter and speaking of the sun, moon, and stars? They use that same language. Well, let's go back to Joseph's dream. You remember the dream that Joseph had in Genesis 37, 9? And he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. Okay, just a coincidence that he had eleven brothers, all right? But in Joseph's dream, is this about the literal sun and moon? First of all, I don't know how the moon would bow or the sun would bow, okay? This may confuse us, but you know, Joseph's father knew exactly what he was talking about, right? I mean, we read, he says, the sun, the moon, and stars are going to bow to me. And they're like, they got mad, okay? <laughs> because they knew what he was saying. In verse 10, and when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him. And said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And he should have said, oh, Dad, you're all confused. I said the sun, moon, and stars. I didn't say you and Mom and the brothers. I didn't say that at all. How did the Father put this together? 
He interprets that as referring to himself, his wife and his sons. They were the heads of the 12 tribes identified as the sun, moon, and stars, respectively. They represented the foundation of the whole Jewish nation. And when Yeshua, therefore, spoke of the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from heaven, he was talking about the destruction of the nation. Not the destruction of the Rakia and all the stars and everything's wiped out, but of the complete dissolution of the Jewish state. Peter was addressing the same event. In the prophetic language, great commotions and revolutions of the earth are often represented by commotions and changes in the heavens. None of these things happen. The stars are still there today, people. Okay? The stars. Now, I think there's a double meaning here in Matthew. The stars represented deities at that time, and deities were judged in AD 70. All right? But talking about the literal stars that give off light, they're still there. We still see them at night. So that's not what he's dealing with here. And contrary to popular opinion, we're not living in what the Bible calls the last days. If people got away from this concept and understood the truth, they wouldn't care what's going on over there in Israel. And every time something happened, people were all getting all scared. It's the end of the world. No, the last days are over. They were of old covenant Israel. We are now living in the new covenant. And the new covenant has no last days. Okay? So, I mean, that's so important for us to understand. The Bible tells us the new covenant is an eternal covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, 20. And may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Yeshua the Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. An eternal covenant has no last days. We're living, people, in the first days of the eternal covenant. We, it's just getting started. And missing these important time statements causes people to misapply by nearly 2,000 years many verses in the Bible. The old heavens and earth of Judaism passed away and we now live in the new heavens and the new earth of the new covenant. And may Yahweh help us to fully understand and appreciate our position in the new heaven and earth where righteousness dwells and where Yahweh dwells with His people. So believers, what happens to Israel today has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. Okay? Nothing at all. I don't care what they do. I don't care if they've blown up the map. I don't care if they blow somebody else. I do care if they do that. But uh, it has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. All prophecy came to a conclusion when Jerusalem was destroyed as God predicted it would be in that generation. <coughs> Excuse me. And those people living in modern day Israel today have no connection at all with the Israeli of God that he brought out of Egypt that we entered into a covenant with. There's no connection at all. The last days were Israel's last days, not ours. I think what's going on over there right now is horrible. And I think it's horrible that our Zionists are standing behind the Israelites in this destruction, but it has nothing to do with prophecy. So I think if most people understood this, they wouldn't have much to talk about, okay? Because every time something happens, we'd get cranking out these messages telling people, this is the end, get ready, it's going to happen, it, you know, all the fear mongering that goes on. And people, well, like I said, just go on YouTube and type in, you know, Israel in the last days or Israel and you know, the future and Israel and the end of the world. And you'll get, so you'll get bombarded with stuff, people trying to make these connections. Ignorantly, okay? There is a connection, as I started with, between Israel and the last days. Because they were Israel's last days and they ended when Israel ended, when the Mosaic Covenant. Israel was all about the Mosaic Covenant. Without that, they don't exist and they do not exist. So... That should give us some peace. I encourage you to be praying for those people over there in Gaza, the Israelites also who are just innocent people involved in all that's going on. This is, in my mind, in my opinion, this is just a land grab. They want to take that strip Gaza back. They want it for their own. Well, it's not just my opinion because the, the document that's been released by Israel says that's what they want to do. They want, it, they want the land. They want to drive them out. The only reason they haven't done it yet is because Iran says, no. Nope. And Putin said, no, better not. So, therefore, thinking about it, all right. What's going to happen in the future? I don't know. Only God knows. But whatever happens, I know this. God's in control. So we can rest and be at peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand Scripture. Understanding the last days makes such a difference, Lord, in the way we read Scripture and the way we understand it. I pray you'd open people's eyes, Lord, to the truth that the last days ended a long time ago. We're living in the beginning days of the new covenant. 
which is eternal. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that is ours. Thank you that we are in your presence right now, Lord. What a blessing of the new covenant. You dwell with us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. Amen. Okay, questions or comments? My wife said to me yesterday, what are you preaching on tomorrow? I said, Israel. She goes, not again. <laughs> I think this was the last one. It all depends on what happens, you know. I know people can accuse me of, you're being political. Yeah, well, if you want to say that's political, you go right ahead. But when they're taking the Bible and twisting it out of place to try to make something of this, I'm going to be sharing my opinion too, okay? Dean from California, he says, my wheels go off the rails when pastors teach fulfilled prophecy may have a future application. Boy, how confusing. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's all fulfilled, but yet, you know, they're saying, yeah, something's going to happen down the road. This is all connected. Yep. Oh, I mean, yeah, self fulfilling for sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know who this is from. It says, when not standing with Israel makes you a goat. Well, that, that's the thing. You know, Pete, you're being accused now. If you say something against Israel, you're under attack, you know, because they're the favored people right now. And so you can't say anything bad about Israel, but I guess I don't care about that. John Mark, Northern California. I've been taught all my life that for the past 2,000 years we've been living in the last days. Yeah, along with, along with everybody else, you know. It wasn't until I discovered full predators that I realized how ridiculous and nonsensical that teaching was. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for your faithful teaching. You're welcome, John Mark. I appreciate you joining us. It, preterism is very freeing, okay? When you understand what the Bible really teaches... You know, other than that, like I said, how many people are just afraid right now because the Israel, the world's going to end, and they're just like scrambling. What do I do? How you know? Run to the yeah, run to the mountains, flee Jerusalem. That's what you should do. Okay. <laughs> 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 Pastor Dave, Mike from Lakeland, Florida. Hey, Lakeland. Okay, I know where that's at. Good to have you with us. You stress the fact of a remnant being elect. That was clearly shown by the fact that. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, of all the adult men that entered Egypt, got to enter the promised land. Due to all their rebellion against God's commandments. That's about the smallest amount of a remnant that you could possibly find. Thanks for your faithfulness to preaching the truth. Thanks a lot, John. That's a good observation there. You're right. I mean, because Lot and his wife and two daughters, that's double that, okay? So yeah, we got Joshua and Caleb. There's the remnant. You know, God and people, God always has a remnant. All through the time, he's always had a remnant, always had people in the midst of whatever that believed, that trusted in him. Falster's here on the farm. Hey, guys, good to, good to, good to see you. <laughs> what was the date in August that the destruction was completed? Uh, does the Christian calendar begin with the date of the destruction? No, it doesn't. It was in August of AD 70. I don't remember the exact date. Josephus tells us. I don't know how accurate it is, but... It was destroyed, and that fits in the fall feast when it actually would have happened. So it kind of all that, all those dates actually fit together. But no, there's not really uh, anything on our, you know, we don't have a day that in Christianity where we celebrate the destruction of Jerusalem. That would be anti-Semitic. <laughs> Gary and Chris and PA. Throughout the Bible, we see. Purposely, the genealogies of God's people, today those who claim they are descended from Israel cannot provide any evidence. Exactly, none at all. And you can't be a priest without that, okay? I believe God made sure of this when he put an end to everything. I, I think that's so clear, you know? God shut it down, and he showed that he shut it down. Okay, I'm done with this people, I'm done with this covenant, and so from there on out, no more sacrifices, no more priesthood, no more temple, but, uh, but all the dispensationalists are saying, well, he's going to rebuild the temple. And then we got the red heifer growing now so we can get some ashes for purification. And how are they going to prove the priesthood? Do they find some genealogy record somewhere? People, it's just, why do they want to do everything over again? It all happened. You know, why do it all over again? They just can't accept, I guess, what happened. Because they want a physical coming of the Lord and a physical renovation of earth and all this other stuff so they can't believe what the Lord said. And that's, you know, 
That's a really sad thing. You're in the same position as the Pharisees of the first century. Same exact position. If the people who call themselves Jews are not the actual Jews of the Bible, did they all die when Jerusalem was destroyed? No, they didn't all die in Jerusalem. Many of them died, but many of them were exported, and then they intermarried, and, you know, and it got, just got so watered down and mixed up. And then a lot of the Kazarians, they just came from Turkey, and they just decided, we need to be Jews. We got to, we'll give you the land, and so they just converted, just like Sammy Davis Jr., okay, he's got no Jewish blood in him, but he's, I think I'll be a Jew, or anybody else, you know, the celebrities that jumps on the bandwagon. There's just no connection. So no, they didn't all die, but they were all dispersed all over the place, and within her marrying, and it just, there's, there's no Jews today, okay? The scientists have proven that, all right, genetically, there's no connection to those people. This is Gary and Gar... Goldsboro, North Carolina. Hey, Gary. Who makes up the house of Judah under the New Covenant? It's all, in the, in the New Covenant, it, all believers, all believers, whether you, you know, were back in the first century, whether you were a Jew, whether you were from the house of Judah, from the house of Israel, it didn't matter. All those people, you know, because God said there's no longer Jew or Gentile. All right, that separation is done. We don't even care about that anymore. It's just all who trust in Christ. Once Christ came, everything changed. You either believed in Him or you were no longer the people. Because they were the people. I'm a Jew. I'm the people of God. And they were until the Lord showed up. Oh, this is what we pointed to the whole time. Do you see Him? I don't believe Him. You're no longer the people. You're not part of the remnant. Dana Troutman says, Thanks for a good teaching. Are there not some of the seed of Abraham still alive? Uh, physically, <clears throat> I doubt it. Like I said, you know, any genetic searches they've done, they can't make any connection there. Surely not all the family line of Abraham were destroyed. No, again, they weren't destroyed, and not all were destroyed in Jerusalem. Many of them were, but they carried them captive. And then, they, you know, you interbreed, you intermarry, and all of a sudden you got everything watered down. And like I said, the most part of the people who say they're Jews now, they just, you know, were Turkish people who just decided, it, this is what I'll do. Someone, I don't know who this is from. They said, I was living in fear of the last days. Thank you for the word, Annette. Amen. You know, amen. If we can say, you know, that's why the Bible says the truth will set you free. And it definitely will set you free. And I really, in my mind, that pertains to any truth, all truth. Okay? Set, when you know the truth, you get set free from the bondage of so many things. From Scott in California. Do you think people will leave the Christian faith if current Israel lost a war and was left desolate? No, I think they just will search for the truth and get some correct teaching and understand what's going on here. I think some people probably will, because some people are so committed that those are God's people and everything, you know. I mean, people are using the Jews as proof that there is a God. That's so ridiculous to me. Well, look what they went through. They became a nation again. Well, that's because Rothschild and all his billions and trillions of dollars put him in there because he wanted him in. Rothschild created the Jewish nation. He did it, Okay. And so, yes, they're, they're fight. it's not a miracle of God this happened. It's, it's money of evil people that this happened. All right? And understanding the history. And again, if you're not clear on this and you want some more information, Mike Sullivan's book, all right, go get that book, read that book. Well, I don't know if you can. Mike, <laughs> Mike said that since we announced it, he's sold out. But he's working on getting more. So, all right, let Mike know you want one. Pre-order, whatever. You get great detail on what we're talking about here. All right, um, Another good one, David. That's what I call real Bible study. Well, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Word. This is Gloria in Illinois. Thank you, Gloria. I appreciate you joining us. appreciate you watching. Um, any other questions here? Are we done? That's all I got from online. It might be good to bring in the message you did before talking about the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and how the Bible uses ethnos and how Israel was part of the nations that were to come back. Yes. You know, that ties in also. God got to the point with Israel, He said, you're not my people, okay, because they had sinned so much. I will call them not my people. They were His people, but then He says, I'm going to call them not my people, my people again, because they're coming to faith in Christ. And so the nations are being regathered. And that was a prediction, the nations be regathered. Most people think of that as physical, but I think it's spiritual. You know, the believers, you know, the nations are coming back. They're believing in their God again. They're trusting in Christ along with the Gentiles, and we become the one house of God to all Israel. But we have a lot of this. If you go on our website and just type in Israel, type in 
Judaism, type in synagogue of Satan, you'll get, you know, a lot, or type, you know, Zionism. You'll bring up, it'll bring up all the messages where I've talked. We've done a lot of stuff on Zionism. And if you're not clear about what Zionism is, we, we've gone into great detail. So go back and read those messages, and I think it'll help you understand what's happening. Gary? Um, you mentioned how the apostles understood the destruction of the temple. And, and when will these things be and, and his second coming? But So they understood the destruction of the temple to be the coming of the Messiah. How does that, is that written out of the Talmud? I mean, is there any correlation between our Old Testament scriptures and the Talmud? Well, the Talmud is just, it was an oral tradition that they wrote down, but they, there's some crazy stuff in there. They, they, they really attack Christ, you know. He's burning in hell and feasts, he's burning in feces in hell, and, you know, they, ta- they attack Mary and they, all this vile stuff. So they, they don't pay much attention to the scriptures, all right. It, that, well, again, they, they view the Talmud as their scriptures, not the Bible, all right? They're not really subject to that. And that's why when Netanyahu quotes the Hebrew scriptures, it's a joke. He didn't believe that, okay? It's, you know, it's just like when all, any of our politicians quote the Bible, you know, like, <laughs> hey, I know the Bible. The sad thing is, though, this whole thing with Jerusalem, and, and see, this was part of the Rothschilds' plan. Zionism was built by the Rothschilds, Okay. The C.I. Schofield, Darby, they were all evil people who put this together and it spread across America. And now everybody thinks Jerusalem, Israel is this big thing. And so now you got all the Christians still today, Israel's all great. And so they're, on, they're pushing their politicians, you better stand with Israel. You better support Israel. And Hagee brags about that. You know, we got so many people, they, bet they can't ignore us. And listen to any politician, they're all Zionists, you know? They're all into this whole thing. You know, it's not because they're an ally of ours. We're paying them, we're supporting them, we send them so much money every month, it's just sickening, you know? It's sickening. But Zion, and again, you follow the money, you go back, and it's all the way back to the Rothschilds who want to own the world, want to run the world, and they're pushing for war. If they can get a war going now, and watch your politicians. Did I say your politicians? Because they're not mine. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with them, Okay. But they're pushing Nikki Haley. Ah, let, they want, she wants to kill everybody on the planet, I think, you know. Let's kill them all, you know. They're just, they're evil, you know. They don't care because they're not going over there. They're sending, you know, you, your sons and your daughters. Let's send them over there. You know, get them killed. Get them blown up. But we're not going to be involved in it. And again, it, the, what happened in Gaza was a false flag. They did it so the world would get behind them. For the most part, it worked. But now, people, are, people have too much information. Because you can get on your phone and find out an hour later some true news to what really did happen. And then you start scratching your head. Because when we first heard that, we said, how terrible, how terrible. They're flying in in gliders. They're killing all these people. And then you start thinking for a second, wait a minute. This is one of the most technically advanced armies in the world. It's got, the most, got the, one of the strongest borders in the world. The Israel Defense Forces, you know, they're nothing to be messed with. Well, they weren't around. How come they were all sent away? They were sent to the West Bank. That's just weird. The same day they, t- they just walked right through the gates. They blew them up. They came in. They started shooting. Nobody, they had no opposition. No one was fighting back. Now, see, that's one thing that will not happen in America. I don't care if there's no army around. You know what the largest army in the world is? The largest standing army in the world is the American hunter. More guns. And that's why Japan never attacked us, mainland. Because they, these people all have guns. Don't mess with them, okay? It doesn't work well when you get into something like that. All right, I could go on forever. I'm having fun. Come on, let, come on down here, Kathy, Van, Zoe, Jeremy, David. Let's, let's close with a song. Let's glory in his name. Sorry. Give thanks to the Lord on his 